end of the nation. Now, let me see. 51552 is our text. So first of all, thanks for all the texts you were sending in. Last weekend, myself and my wife and our friends attended the Queen Bitch Quiz at the Bowie Fest. My God, we were talking about that this day last week. Our team quizzing the aliens didn't do too well on the day, and although we didn't know it at the time, we got together for what was essentially a celebration of Bowie's life. Nice way to say goodbye. Uh, also, Sue Good in West Cork saw Bowie in 73 in the UK. Totally blew me away. Outrageous and life-changing. He will live on forever. Uh, 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 Bowie songs appreciating the legend, waiting all week to hear some blasting out of the radio. Well, in fact, we will be playing a lot of David Bowie songs tomorrow on the programme. It's a lot of talk today, but an awful lot of just songs tomorrow. And over on uh, what, is, what is it, RT Gold at 6 o'clock this evening, I'll be playing my 10 favourites. Well, something like that that could change by 4 o'clock. Who knows? Uh, I'm 30, not that young, but young enough to continue being inspired by Bowie's dynasty and will continue to bring this forward to future generations. I was at the first gig in the Docklands in London in 1990. Had no ticket, it was sold out, but just as Bowie came on stage, this woman went into labour and her husband gave me and my wife their tickets as we were first in line at the front doors. What a show. Great memories. Danny and Letter Kenny. I was at that in 1990, covering that for Channel 4, interviewing Bowie fans on the way, coming out. Bizarre stuff. Anyway, what we're going to give you now is an interview with David Bowie between now and uh, 1 o'clock. So uh, let's start with some music. This one I think you'll know pretty well, frankly, because this goes back. We've mentioned it a bunch of times, actually. And this is um, Space Oddity. 51552 is the text. David, you've always switched styles and always switched moods, but I mean... The way you're switching lately, it just seems so effortless. Now, is it? Is it just a natural thing for you, yeah. or do you have to work at it? No. I think because my interests were always in, uh, at any given time, were in new music, at what, right, whatever yeah. period, yeah. is that I've always, that's always been, whereas other people possibly would be more interested in what's happening in the mainstream, and that would be probably the body of their record collection. My record collection looks like some kind of bizarre bizarre relic oriented scrapyard of uh, of uh, everything from industrial to old harry part stuff from Car california legendary stardust cowboy wild man fisher i mean it's got the most bizarre things in throughout the years and those are the things that i listen to um i like that <laughs> Wait a minute, legendary Stardust Cowboy I yeah. know well. I mean, yeah. he's, he's got this guitar he made out of a bucket and he yes. sings on top of the bonnet of cars. <laughs> and uh, he, he, he had a one-legged trumpet player. That's right, he did. Yeah. <laughs> also, uh, wait a minute, Wild Man Fisher, I once yeah. heard a double album called An Evening with Wild Man <laughs> yes. Fisher. Now, hold on, I actually bought a Harry Parch album once. Really? Is the, yeah, I got Good it. man. No, I'll tell you what, I read so, an article yeah. in Rolling Stone about Harry Parch. Yeah. I went to a shop in New York and I bought it in, in there. And he's got all these things like, um, he's got a song called Barstow on, on the world of Harry Parch. Yeah. And he's made all these, like, gourd Three instruments and like, things right. that are like chimes that you, when you walk in the door. And the, but I mean, the guy there's was... actually a school of Harry Parch in California, and that really? they've resurrected all those instruments. They found them in his warehouses after yeah. he died, and uh, they've uh, refurbished them all. And um, they've got uh, sixty or seventy of these huge instruments that he made out of glass and tin cans and and stuff that he actually executed. In okay, well, I'll tell you, there's one side of that album that has no vocals on it, yeah. and I had it on vinyl in the old days of forty-five and thirty-three. Yeah. And when I played it, I played it at the wrong speed and I didn't know until I turned off the other side and the vocal yeah. was different. I didn't even know it was the wrong speed. But those kinds of things, those kinds of things, that, that I think they're, they're glorious. I mean, I played 78s at, uh, at 33 and got really good ideas <laughs> from them. But that, it's like it's playing around with all those sonic areas, yeah. you know, that, that's what makes life interesting. I don't want to just put down information I already know. And I, that's that's not what I want to do in life, you know. I much I really want to just sort of keep ch keep changing the spin on what sound can do, you know. Well, then besides the sound, mm. what about the tools? I mean, is it technology with organic instruments? Is that the yeah? That's that's, that's not really changed since the late seventies. That's mm. pretty much where I'm at, and that hasn't changed at all. Um, so the interesting thing for me is that. In those days, there weren't that many of us doing it. There was a, a, a large group, but not like it is today. But it is because we were doing that back then. It, it's a vocabulary that I completely understand. So yeah. the atmosphere at the moment, the way people use randomization and fragmentation and the way that they, uh, they uh, treat and abuse their, their computer subject matter, uh, is something I'm entirely comfortable with. So right. for me, it almost feels like coming home in that way sonically far more than say the 80s which i really I had such a bad time kind of feeling in sync with it all so this period it's it, it really feels again sonically like a continuation of the late 70s in a way it's like it's picked up 
from what was happening back then. Even though there's been a, a swell all the way through the 80s with bands as diverse as Glenn Branca and Sonic yeah. and Pixies and whatever. Um, the, and uh, probably ministry and all, you know, sort of the industrial yeah. movement that was uh, happening then. Those roots that were in the late 70s are something that I understand completely. It's well, the that, language I speak. Okay, but then like, if you get like Low Heroes Lodge or End of 70s, yeah. And then let's dance the most commercial. Well, then scary monsters and, and scary monsters, which, which also yeah. probably was the more industrial of the of the four right. albums in yeah. its own way. It was again harder edged, and the drum sound was even more destroyed than it was on the uh, the Berlin albums. Right. Yeah. And that was thanks to Tony Visconti, by the way, who right. I would cite as being responsible for the change of tonality in drum sounds. Um, but we, when he brought in a harmonizer in uh, 76, mm. it, it complete drums were never the same again. Right. But do you think in some ways, like after the commercial success they've let stand, that you're saying that the 80s, you might have needed those 80s that weren't that great tonight in, 70, in 84 and Never Let Me Down in, yeah. in um, 87. Do you think you needed that to get through to where you are? Well, I think... Because the difference and the distance between David Bowie 96, say, yeah. or David Bowie 97, yeah. as opposed to David Bowie 76, it's just a million miles. Well, I, no, I think you're wrong there. I think the, the you're I'm closer to what was happening in '76. If you think station. the Station to Station album is, it has aspects. For, uh, for instance, the, the the first track, Station to Station, you can identify far more of the signals on that with what I'm doing now than say what you could do in '87, yeah. when I had things like Never Let Me Down, which is like, why was I making that? You know, it's, it's, it did '87. That that the. Uh, Probably 80, 84 and 87, the two albums that I produced in those years, almost had nothing to do with, with what I'd written before or subsequently. I mean, they really were odd albums. They were odd, the odd men out. But that's okay. I mean, it's, uh, you've got to be prepared to do crap, you know, to get to the good stuff. I think. You're going to push yeah. all the time. You've got to really be prepared to look like a pranny and do terrible things at some point or other and uh, just keep assuming that if you keep going through everything, uh, eventually you'll, you'll see light at the end of the tunnel and it won't be an oncoming train. Right, well then, is the pinnacle of Pranny... <laughs> <laughs> is the pinnacle like of that. Pranny, say... The pinnacle of Pranny... The, the year after Never Let Me Down, in other words, Glass Spider. Um, yeah, I think... I'm going to be honest, I, I think, saw that gig, it didn't work for me. No, it didn't work for me either, in anywhere larger than a 5,000-seater. I yeah. think in a 5,000-seater, because I'd really... I designed it to be an all enveloping kind of spectacular in as much as it was a bit three ring circus. There was always yeah. three, of all, three or four events happening at yeah. the same time on stage. Yeah. It was multi-event, a very fast event horizon. Individually there were some incredibly good ideas on that stage. Yeah. but And in a small environment it really worked well yeah. because uh, uh, when your audience, <clears throat> when your nose is pressed against it all, it's kind of wow, it's like a wonder world. But to put it, when you're a thousand rows back, it just becomes this huge mass of confusion. None of it makes any sense and that was a really bad mistake. No, I never thought of that, that it would have worked so well. You're, you're right, it would have worked because I saw it out in the field with 30,000 people. It's just, a, it, was a, it was a really bad con conceptual idea right. for, for that size of place. And if I'd, if I'd I was still, I was, I was really designing on an intimate level and I didn't really get that. I was too thick to realise that it wouldn't translate in a big place. I soon found out. <laughs> uh, but I look at it, actually for me works better on video than it ever worked live because you, could, you, you, you have the intimacy of the camera being there on the stage seeing yeah. all the different things that are happening. Yeah. Is the point for you then constant reinvention or is it just that the excitement of the shock of the new is just what excites you? I'm not, it's not, yeah, the reinvention thing, I'm not, uh, I don't buy into that at all. I think, I think there's a real continuity with what I do and it's just about expressing myself in a contemporaneous fashion. I'm not, you know, it's, the reinvention thing, it's, it's an easy, it's an easy description, isn't it? It's kind of... It is, but I mean, the, like, those... Hey, Dave, you're a real chameleon, you know. <laughs> I didn't say that. Well, you know something, David, I'm probably the chameleon of rock, you know, because... What I do is all about cha cha cha, you know, and it kind of gets all that. And I'm then, glad you, do, you know, not me. and then the French you get with, uh, why did you kill Ziggy? <laughs> you know, and the cliches are, you know, a stack high. But re I, what I, I, I'd much prefer to just think of myself as a, 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 
a modern working artist. Uh, it's as simple as that. And uh, I just work within the um, fabric of, of, of my society. And, and it's the things, the enthusiasms that I have for the things that I feel are important in our culture. And I'll try and use the threads of those compositely for the kind of thing that I try and do, whether it's visual or, or musically. Okay, so I won't make you mention names, don't I? but I'll mention names of your peers, say from Rod Stewart right around to Elton John. They surf the mainstream. They're in the middle of the road all the time doing what it is they've always done. Mm. And, like, how dare anybody suggest they should take on anything that's happening around them in a younger context because it doesn't work for them or they don't want to do it. But it's a cop-out, isn't it? We obviously just have different perspectives. I think it's the same. My choice... Always a diplomat, isn't it? It's not that, honestly. I, I mean, I just don't think we do the same thing. I think we're mm. both in the music, or all of I us know. are in the music field. It's just my choices have always been very different to my contemporaries and my even my very close friends who are of my age and, and are my contemporaries we don't actually have the same ambitions at all no. not even remotely and probably my uh, my fixation is that I could have been a painter I could have been a painter or I could have been a musician I opted for being a musician but really I still apply I, I probably my mind is is much more in the <sighs> more in the in the field of a painter than it is or, or, or of a musician in that way. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, stop it. Okay, well then, hold on. <laughs> How about this? Wait a minute. Then on that point, a description that somebody gave of you lately, will you accept this? The Beckenham Arts Lab boy who was sacrificed to rock music in the late 60s has re-emerged as the gentleman artist collector patron of the 90s. Oh. <laughs> it's no, a, just It's all no. a bit Dame Bowie, that. <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> I'm afraid Lab um, Bowie, all right, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh... uh I'll go back to. I'm sorry. I won't shift from. I'm a. I'm just a, a, a working artist. Okay, but working basically, probably in a modern field. Okay, and there's no way David Bowie wants to work with a safety net. If you, if, if you like, absolutely. Not really, because when, uh, when I've endeavoured to do that, I've just felt that the most dissatisfied creatively as as I've as I ever could feel, and I really felt that I was just destroying everything that I thought worthwhile in my work, and uh, I just. Uh, I felt really disappointed in myself. I yeah. thought that I was letting myself down and letting my work down. And I would have quit. I really would have quit. I think I really would have gone back to uh, just, just sort of, you know, Im immersing myself in the visual arts. It was quite, a, quite. A, it seemed at one time a real easy decision. You know, here I was making lots of money, uh, performing to these huge audiences, and thoroughly uh, uncomfortable and and unhappy with life and I was getting more enjoyment out of just being back in the um, studio I mean the painting studio and yeah. all that and I thought well why bother you know I've obviously I got nothing left that really I've uh, that's it you know I've come to the vacuum of my life and I guess you see I was around 40 <laughs> so you know looking back on it one also wonders if it wasn't sort of the inevitable midlife crisis right, yeah. as well yeah. because it all happened in my sort of 40 to 44 period um, I tried you know so hard to uh, feel okay with it all but it, it was just obvious to me that it was all going incredibly wrong um, so I was about to give up and if it hadn't have been uh, for Reeves Gabrels, my guitar player, right. um, I probably would have. But he was, uh, he's such an unquenchable, uh, pithy, witty, intelligent lad. And he said, well, there is a, a second option, and that is you just, you just completely back off everything you're doing and just try doing all the things that you used to enjoy. The, what, the reason that you started doing music in the first place. And uh, the, the, uh, the result of that, of course, was Tim Machine, which I know it's hard to believe, but it was actually the best thing that ever happened to me in that way. Mm. There were four years. It wasn't an overnight band either. No. We were together for four years. It was a long period. Most bands are together less than that, and they yeah. break up, you know. We really stuck it out. And in that period, I think I learnt relearn what it was to write for myself not try and meet an audience's expectations um and that really set me back on on the path of what i like doing 
Prodigy and uh, Hunky Dory, the man who sold the world, of course. You're listening to David Bowie here, an interview. I'm trying to work out the year. I don't have it written on it. I think it's 1997, is it? I think it probably is 1997, this one. The one on TV last night was 1987. Crikey. Um, OK, where are we? Yes, 51552 is our text. And thanks a million for all the texts that you are sending in. This one here, first album I ever bought was in 1973, The Man Who Sold the World. I was 13, and it was a life-changing moment. A lot of texts like that. Taking a nice big detour just to listen to the programme. The car seems like the best place to be. Um, 51552, I'm just thinking we're not playing enough music. It's a lot of talk on the programme this morning with Woody Woodmansey and... Uh, Tony Visconti earlier on and David Bowie now as well there's more of David Bowie in this interview coming up now until one o'clock so uh, tomorrow at least an hour of just music okay we'll play David Bowie so what would you like to hear tomorrow of course you'll all send in your text and I'll pretend that that's what you want and it'll just be my favourite ten <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, by the way, I'll be doing my favourite ten or a bunch of my ten on uh, RT Gold tonight at six o'clock for an hour with David Bowie stuff. But anyway, and um, we'll go back to the interview after we take a break, which is now five one five five two. Your favourite Bowie songs. Hey, you mentioned there that you were thinking maybe of giving up and maybe just going to the visual arts in yeah. some way. Now the thing is, didn't you give up in one way in terms of you sort of told your fans, look. I am now doing a retiring, uh, a, a, a retirement tour, a hits tour. But that came, hits, that came on, yeah, it. but that came, that was on the wave of a great new euphoria. I knew what I'd found back in myself and I knew how I, ha, how I had to get back to what I was doing and, and I had to make some kind of public manifesto that I would really be pushed by. Yeah. It was important in a way both with Tim Machine and the Sound and Vision Tour, to paint myself into a corner so that my choices were very limited. And the choice really was start producing great work or shut nice. up. Nice. And that was, that was what I did virtually. The, 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 and now I'm producing the great work. OK, OK, <laughs> wait a minute. Uh, the press release says something along the lines of that, like you have a fascination with living in the spectre of imminent apocalypse. He uh, was Ziggy. He was the thin white joke. Yeah, yeah well, he was these the things. chameleon oh, I know, of rock. The point about it is, I mean, surely, since, like two years before you were born, they dropped the bomb in Hiroshima. So surely imminent apocalypse is every day of the week since 1945. Of course, the day I was born, apparently, according to the great tome that came out a couple of years ago, Jackson Pollock did his first... Um, uh, dribble painting. <laughs> Great. <laughs> there you go. What so that tell That us? was apocalyptic in itself. Oh, apocalyptic you know? I mean, look what that did The to day you were born world. was the same day as Elvis. Did that, is, did that mean anything to you? Or did it? Well, being an elitist, I much prefer the Jackson Pollock connection. Yeah, right, very good. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, of course, when I was a kid, uh, uh, the idea that Elvis and I, and my cousin was in love with Elvis, Christina, and uh, she had all those early uh, 78s. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mean, like most girls at that particular time. So I, and she was like so happy that my birthday was the same as his. She said, oh, there's a family connection. So I had, I was like seven or eight and having this put in my head. So it probably did awfully perverse things to me. I thought, well, oh, I better be the British Elvis then. Right, cool. Well, Obviously, then... I've got no choice. <laughs> OK, well, then going back then to the pinnacle of planets that we were talking about earlier on, did you actually go to an Elvis gig at Madison Square Garden dressed indeed. as Ziggy? Or yes. Like, come on, you sat in the front row. That's absolutely right. And I got <laughs> there. Sad, and it? I got there late. Really? It was, oh, it was the, the one of the most Excuse me, he's coming in here. It was awful. Well, of course, I was totally unknown in the States. This was pre any kind of uh, knowledge about me in the States. This would be Hunky Dory 70 direction. Yeah, a little bit later than that. It was, uh, I was pretty much there with the, I think I was pretty much there with the uh, short cropped hair on the platform, the yeah. Kansai yeah. platform boots and all that. Uh, and I remember getting there late because my plane was uh, on time, but the show was also on time. We thought it might be delayed or yeah. something just because shows are usually rock shows. We didn't realise how professional and showbiz the whole thing was. And uh, I got in there and started walking down the aisle and I wished the earth would just open and swallow me. I thought, why did I get here late? And... Uh, he didn't give me a ticket off or anything. <laughs> I'm not sure. I know that he saw me coming in and... Uh, but he didn't make any comment. But I mean, was he dressed in his sort of Las vegas -y kind of hamburger? No, it wasn't vibes? quite... It hadn't got to that hadn't full that badge, kind yeah. of ostentation. It was midway between the Las Vegas and the black leather. Yeah. So he, was, he looked, still looked pretty funky. He looked pretty good. And he was thin and uh, just looked... Remember, he was only like 30 years old. He, he was still pretty incredible. Yeah, right. You know, it was like, wow, that is Elvis, you know, up there, sort of... Uh, <laughs> 20 yards away, you know, yeah. it was an incredible uh, thing to see. It was an, an incredible thing to see. 
Do you think in some ways that getting married, that's actually made you a better person towards appreciating other people, if you like, that maybe you've even got more real friends now than you did maybe 20 years ago? I'm not sure which, if it's uh, chicken or egg. Um, yeah. I think probably I couldn't have carried out this relationship and, and continued it if I hadn't have been in a place where I was ready for a real long-lasting relationship with somebody. So um, I, I, had, I had changed. I mean, I have been, I've been changing over the last 10 years. Always the chameleon. Hey. <laughs> um, I, I guess I just got more... I, I, I probably had a, a, a greater grasp on the reality of what my life had become and what I wanted my life to become. So I knew that I really was looking for some kinds of emotional um, stabilities, you know, things that would kind of hold me to the, tether yeah. me to the ground a bit more. So I was in a good place when we met for that. And, uh, and I guess the, the, the uh, reciprocal love between us has kind of just kept me uh, in, extremely buoyant about life. and. Uh, well, I mean, love still. I mean, you know, it's as yeah. simple as that. I think being in love has an awful lot to do with it. Right. What about being in L.A., say, in the mid-70s? Was it that bad? I mean, is the story true that you don't even remember recording um, Station to Station? Because if that's true, you should maybe forget some more. Sometimes that's I don't, I don't, happens I, all the I, I can't even, I can't think of one, I can only think of one incident on Station to Station. It's the only thing I can remember. And that was uh, trying to get El Slick to just to to I remember working with Earl on the guitar sounds out in the studio itself and uh, screaming the feedback sound that I wanted at him uh, I remember doing that I also remember he, uh, telling him take a Chuck Berry riff dan, 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 and just play it all the way through the solo don't deviate from it just play that one riff over and over and over again even though the chords are changing underneath just keep it going I said, what, man? And I said, I said it'll work, it'll work. <laughs> I, that's, and that's about it. That's about all I remember of it. I can't even remember the studio. I know it was in L.A. because I've read it was in L.A. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to describe... i tell you what I do remember, though. I don't, I, what I do remember is that the, I believe... The guy who owned the studio, it might have been that one, it might have been another studio, I mean, it starts to get... Yeah. He was also in a similar place to me. <laughs> and he just bought this in incredible house up in the hills with all the contents, and he invited me over one night, and he said, man, I got this, like, huge library, he said, all these books, you like all that book shit, you want some? So I went into the library, and I found these five volumes of a 17th century printing of the works of Francis Bacon. I mean, it was just like, this is unbelievable. I said, I'll have these five if you don't want them. Uh -huh. I said, yeah, it's just old shit. <laughs> so so um, I walked away with those five volumes of, uh, with things like New Atlantis in them and all his experiments, uh, Bacon writing about his experiments about refrigerating chickens, which of course eventually killed him um, because he froze to death while seeing if one of his chickens had frozen <laughs> in the snow. Free refrigeration incredible experiment, and the guy was a mu just incredible. Um, and uh, only a few weeks later, the guy was found dead in his swimming pool with two birds also dead under incredibly mysterious circumstances. I, sorry, I just that I remember that. <laughs> I remember that things like that. I kind of remember there's certain bizarre high points that kind of like stick out like icebergs from the sea of mystery did you turn it away from drugs then is this like spirituality that you had to find is, this, is that the route you take Cause some people do to get into the sort of back to a normal life firstly physically i was uh, yeah. i was painfully uh, emancipated <laughs> emaciated rather emancipated it came <laughs> later uh, emaciated I, I was just just not even skin and bone. I was just bone. I was bone with these veins wrapped around them. I mean, I was the most, oh, God knows what weight I was, but I was way below. Like, I think at some points I almost reached like 80 pounds, you know. It was yeah. just really, really painful. Um, and also my disposition was uh, uh, left a lot to be desired. I was just, I was, I was complete, I was just... 
paranoid, uh, manic depressive. It was all the usual paraphernalia, emotional paraphernalia that comes right, with yeah. abuse of uh, amphetamines and cokes and all that. Okay, if you go back to your 20s and you're driven and you're now... Who in, wants to go back to uh, No, sorry, in your 20s and age, <laughs> not, and now it's the 90s and yeah. you're 50 years of age now and you're driven. What's the difference between the two drivens? Uh, I think the first, uh, the earlier one was a, a dry... I have a drive now. I don't feel... I'm not sure that I'm driven. It's different. I have a motor which works at a 24-hour length. Yeah. It's, I, I'm very aware of the day that I'm living through now. I'm very happy about being in the now in that way. And it sounds very neo-Buddhistic, but it's true. I, I, I feel very content with what I do on each day as it happens. But I think when I was in my 20s, I was always looking to the next thing. Yeah. I wasn't enjoying recording. I'd make records, but I was thinking about what the show would look like and where that, and what we could do with that. And I was always three steps ahead of myself, so I never enjoyed process. Yeah. But now I really enjoy making an album right. and then actually doing the tour and enjoying the performances, you know. Right. And that's a different kind of feeling entirely. And possibly it's not possible until you get older. I don't know. I think when you you are young, your event, your your projected event horizon is a lot more fascinating to you. You're always thinking about what you can do next sure, or, yeah. you know, I want to do this or uh, just in regular life, if I get this job, maybe it will lead to this kind of promotion and, you know, that kind sure. of, yeah. just a young man's ambition overrides more or less everything. And it just, it really does change when you get older. Right. And I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have guessed when I was 25 that you could actually still have the same enthusiasm. Sure. Yeah. It, 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 it's modulated in a different way. It, it, it becomes a different kind of... It has different characteristics. It's still there, the enthusiasm, and, but it's not so ambition-driven. Cool. All right, David, thanks very much for talking to us. My pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Enjoyed it a lot. Great. Good man. <laughs>